In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We find ourselves in the synagogue of Nazareth, which means to say, this is the place where Jesus came with St. Joseph to hear the Word of God. As logically we know culturally, the women didn't enter into the synagogue, but they stayed outside in the part to the back. But here, we have to imagine that Jesus, as a child, as an adolescent, since his young adulthood, now a young man, he was here every week studying the word of the Lord, listening to the word which was proclaimed. Logically, it has to be proclaimed from an ambo, right? It wasn't an altar here. What's important about this place? What is so important is that how we saw yesterday, after Mass, we spoke of the scroll which is unrolled which goes slowly unrolling the scroll of the Word. The Word, we always have it in this, this little book. The Old Testament, were in scrolls. Well, when the rabbi was going to, to read the scripture, he had to unroll it. And so now we're going to hear what Luke chapter 4 says. He came to Nazareth, where he had grown up, and went, according to his custom, into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read. Why do they put? Why does the Why does Luke the evangelist put that detail? He went to the synagogue like always, but he stood up to read. What does that mean to say? That he wasn't the assigned one. You have to imagine, here it's full of men who have come to hear the word of the Lord. And Jesus enters, and he enters, he stands up, and he goes to read without being assigned. And that's why St. Luke puts that detail. He stood up to read that he was simply one more who came to listen, supposedly. But he stands up in the midst of, I imagine, the, the faces of surprise of, of why did he get up, right? It, he had to be assigned. It was something serious. And so he stands up and he puts himself in the place and he extends his hand and they entrust to him the, the scroll. And what does the Lord do here? And I like this part in, this, in the movie of Jesus when he goes to slowly unroll the scroll. Where does he stop? In the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 61. It, Isaiah is the prophet of the Messiah. Almost all the prophecies which indicate details of the Messiah are in Isaiah. And so he reads from Isaiah, but he's reading it, and you're going to hear what he says at the end. You have to also think that the authority which the Lord has to speak. And for us, authority is, is poorly understood. We think that authority is to yell and to, to demand. Authority is the power one has to communicate the truth. He doesn't have to raise the, his voice. He doesn't have to fight. We're going to see the exorcism. How does he exercise? But the Lord, one of the things which we hear repeatedly in the Gospel, is, but why does he have so much authority? What he says has authority. And it's to say that he, what he says we listen to, what he says penetrates us. And the Lord here goes unrolling the book and he stops in Isaiah 61, a super important passage. And he reads the following, right? Try to situate yourselves because... Here, here I'm standing, but no, right here was the Lord standing. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
porque me ha because he has anointed me. Me ha he has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor. That means he has sent me to proclaim the gospel. Who are the poor? The poor are, is all of us. All the sinners, we are the poor ones because we are we have lost the inheritance which we receive which we received in creation. The the inheritance that the Father gave us when we were created, we've lost. And that's why Jesus, when he speaks to the poor, he's no longer speaking of a of, of material lacking. He's speaking of all human person, the poor that has that have lost all that God the Father has given them. We've we've lost grace, we've lost immortality. We've lost all the preternatural gifts that the Lord gave us when we were created. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives. This is important. To proclaim the gospel, but what is the first that he's going to do practically? Give liberty to captives. That is to free us from the slavery of sin. And recovery of sight to the blind. And so we know that he, is, he healed many blind people. And we're going to study and read it, how he leads the different blind people. But he didn't come only to heal the blind physically. But rather he came as the light, which we saw in the prologue, which illumines at all men and that's why here he's not speaking only of, of physical blindness but also of spiritual blindness he is the one who comes to illumine with the proclamation of the, the good news to illuminate our souls our minds our hearts so that we can understand what the kingdom of heaven is he comes to let the oppressive the oppressed go free and in this account for the people of Israel, the word oppression was very strong. That they use it now as another system, but it was very strong because they were a people who passed from being oppressed in Egypt. They arrive in the Promised Land and they're again oppressed, truly, by another system, which were the Romans. So for them, the word oppression in reality was was certain they were oppressed they did not have freedoms and so when he says i come to bring freedom to the oppressed they understand what he's saying he's going to raise them from the oppressor he's they, he's going to lift the oppressor from them so that they can live in freedom many after could understand this and interpret it adequately others the zealots did not interpret it adequately and they thought that he was coming to free the people from the Romans. And that's why Judas was one of them, right? And he thought that he was a man who came like a warrior to decapitate all the Romans, ending with the emperor with violence. But he came to free the captives. And who are the captives? Who are the oppressed? They're all of us oppressed by the flesh, by the dis by their regular desires, by the passions, the, the wrath, all the capital sins we are oppressed by. And he came to bring us freedom. Freedom is the principal motto of Christ. He manifests it here two times in four phrases. And I come to proclaim a year of grace of the Lord. That means that I come to proclaim a new time. A new age. I have come to give history a, a new grace, to make all things new. What are the new, new things that the Lord gives us? He's going to change the lakes. He's going to change the mountains. Is he going to change the mountains? The human heart begins a new era for the human person where he can go back gradually to be liberated from sin and gradually grow until he uh, he reaches like the saints to the original innocence that is redemption the word redemption means to 
to go back to your original innocence and when you could speak of the of the word redemption because he, he is the redeemer of man what does that mean that he comes to free us only from sin it begins there but it's that sin brothers and sisters has three personalities sin affects your character sin inclines your your desires and your interests sin deforms the whole human person just like grace returns the beauty to the human person and that's why we can see the saints and say how beautiful my god because they were redeemed sin disfigures us and redemption beautifies us he rolled up the book imagine he finished he rolled up the book he gave it to the synagogue assistant and he sat down everyone it says has their eyes fixed on the Lord and so Jesus begins to tell them for me this I would have liked to really have been in a little hole watching this moment because he has read Isaiah 61 and everyone was thinking they felt the authority of that reading but they were thinking this this one just came and put himself to read it but when he says all of a sudden and this word which you have heard is fulfilled today here imagine that moment I mean this, who, who the Spirit has anointed, who has come to liberate the captives, to give sight to the blind, to proclaim the good news, that is me. And that's why here he says in English, I, I like it so much more because it says, at your hearing, this has been fulfilled. And so here in this synagogue, which which almost no one visits, in this synagogue, the Lord proclaims himself as what? As the Messiah. What happens after this? Some begin to test him, others begin to reject him. That means here, the prophecy of Simeon begins to, to fulfill itself. Elevation for some and fall for others. And while the Lord goes leaving, and while he's leaving, they begin to follow him. And this moment had to have been very difficult for Our Lady because Our Lady was there outside. And so when he goes leaving, the mass of persons come to him. Some want to protect him, and others, they want to take him to where we're staying which is the mountain of the cliff. That is, in the moment where he proclaims himself Messiah, they already want to kill him. They want to silence him. See how the devil is. He was born, what can a baby do? What can a baby do? Why does he have so much fear? The devil manifested through Herod to a baby because what he wanted to stop was the voice of God, which is what's happening in our world today. And so this is important. This synagogue is important. Here the Lord proclaims himself at your listening to this word. Here it was fulfilled today. The Messiah from here, he begins to reveal himself. And that's why from here we're going to go to Cana. And what does he do in Cana? His first miracle. Okay, and so now we're going to go to the well where Our Lady went every day to, to get water. And it's something very beautiful that I'll tell you there about us.